Ariza Kufour. We get details for you as President to Kufour as well uh, issues one of his own. Also, this afternoon, spare parts dealers at Abosokai lock up shops for two hours as they issue two weeks ultimatum to GRA to stop intimidation at their shops. Uh, so close it down all the shops means uh, we are serious and we are going to face GRA squarely. There is nowhere GRA can use intimidation, harassment and threat making. That can never, intimidation can never win any, any, any good dialogue. And much later, the minority in Parliament are accusing government of insensitivity over failure to commence sea defence project after sea tides this weekend again destroyed property in the southern part of the Volta region. We have details of these stories a lot more if you stay with us for the next 30 minutes. Pleasure that you could be a part of this afternoon's bulletin. It's streaming live on Facebook. Our handles 3FM927. Same handles on Twitter as well. 3FM927. I am Eric Mawinagbeta. And this afternoon, tributes continue to pour in for late former First Lady of the Republic, Theresa Kufour, and longtime NDC politician Enoch Temensa, following both their passing. Theresa Kufour, who was wife of former President John Ajikum Kufour, the second president of the Fourth Republic of Ghana passed Sunday afternoon at age 87. According to family sources, Mrs. Kufour had been unwell for some time. She eventually succumbed late afternoon on Sunday in the house at the Apediasi near Ibri. Also, former NP for Ningo Pram Pram and Council of State member Enoch Tay Mensa, otherwise known as E.T. Mensa, he died in South Africa where he was undergoing treatment for an undisclosed illness. My colleague Joseph Akable uh, is joining me in studio with a bit of details, particularly on what people have been saying. Uh, Joseph, let's start with the present because he has been speaking to the person of Madame Kufu. What exactly has he been saying? I mean, quite a detailed statement issued by President Akufuado put out on uh, his Facebook page. It reads, I'm very saddened by the just announced news of the death of Mrs. Theresa Kufu, our nation's former first lady and wife of the second president of the republic his excellency john ajekum kufo her passing reminds me keenly of human mortality that is that the almighty will come for each and every one of us at the appropriate time mama theresa as she was affectionately called was a devoted a companion of president kufo throughout their 61 years of marriage she was an invaluable and constant source of advice encouragement and prayers for him a member of a well-known family from odumasi in the Buno region sister of the renowned statesman, the late J.H. Mensa, and aunt of President Kufo's secretary, the brilliant diplomat Ambassador D.K. Osei. She was politically astute and was a major contributor to her husband's political success. She was a composed and articulate first lady and polyglot fluent in several languages, including Ewe, uh, who brought great dignity to the position. I knew several members of her family, especially a celebrated brother, and I am very grateful that I had the opportunity to know her too. Her warmth, kindness, and grace were exceptional. She bore the vicissitudes of life with great stoicism and an unshakable belief in the sovereignty of Almighty God. My wife, Rebecca, the First Lady, and I will miss her a lot. We extend our deepest condolences to President Kufo and their children. So very detailed statement yeah, quite, from quite detailed uh, the from president. The president. Yeah. Um, any other individuals uh, making commentary in relation to her passing as well? The First Lady has, on her own behalf, also put out uh, one. She says, I have learned with great sadness the passing of former First Lady of our dear country, Mrs. Theresa Kufo. My deepest condolences to former President uh, His Excellency John Ajikum Kufo, the family and friends in these difficult times. Auntie Theresa led an exemplary life both privately and as first lady. May her soul rest in peace. Right then, Joseph, many thanks for those details. That's my colleague Joseph Akable with details on the tributes led by uh, the president, Nanado Danko Kufuado. Uh, my colleague Duke Menso Poku as well is at the residence of uh, the former president, 
Uh, he joins us on the telephone line as well with a bit more details. Duke, uh, describe to us the mood as you arrive at the airport residence of the former president. Well, it's a, I mean, it's, it's a very solemn atmosphere here. Uh, it's actually almost quiet, very deserted, for want of a better word. Uh, there's only the domestic staff, I mean, who are around. And um, we just engaged them off the, off, off the cuff of the camera of the record. And they're telling us how good Madame Teresa Kufo was to them and how they are all getting ready to go. Everything is happening now, which is the PBRC uh, residence of the Kufo family now. But um, the significance of this residence is that we know that for the time that President Kufo was leader of this country, and he, he didn't, he never stayed in the official residence of the president, which is, um, the coach was the castle then, before the Jubilee House was, was, was completed and was occupied by President Mills, who was the first president who occupied that. So, um, I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, later on, President uh, mm. John Mahama, of course, President Mills did not occupy the Jubilee House. But so, uh, the entire period of the four years as leader of the country, he lived in this, this private residence with the support of the then mother of the nation, Madame Teresa Kufo, who the nation is currently mourning today. And that's the significance of the airport residence. What you do not much is going on is just a period of mourning, solemnity, and uh, really neighbors who have a lot of good things to say about the former first lady. Right then, Duke. Uh, many thanks for those details. Duke Mensah Puku, my colleague as well, at uh, the airport residence of the former president, John Ajikunko for We headed towards the Pediasi residence as well, where the expectation is that a lot of dignitaries will be coming through uh, to offer their condolences to the former president, a subject matter that we will stay on. Also of mention is the person of E.T. Mensah as well, who will be in a former constituency. He's, he was MP there for nearly 20 years, Ningo Pram Pram constituency as well, and get reactions from residents there uh, who knew him uh, during his time as a member of parliament. But away from this and to some other matters, and the Abosokai Spare Parts Dealers Association, they've given government a two-week ultimatum to hold the deployment of GRA compliance and invigilation tax force to their shops. The ultimatum was preceded by a two are shut down of the market in protest of the action by the GRA, which they argue amounts to intimidation. The association says they will have no option than hit the streets if their concerns are not addressed. George Queen is my colleague. He joins us from uh, the Abusokai area. George, a closure of their shops for two hours. First, talk to us about the sort of impact they were looking at with that particular decision. So, yeah, Marla, thanks for having me. Good afternoon. And so, yeah, Today, Trader decided to, you know, uh, send a strong signal to uh, Ghana Revenue Authority and entirety government. Uh, they are just kicking against GRA's compliance and vigilation exercise. So, with the closure of the show, clearly, people that came here to, to buy wares were disappointed. Those that had to wait, that those that had time to wait, actually wait, where those that couldn't have to just go are very disappointed. But this, for them, is uh, something that they can do more if whatever concerns they are they have are not met because what it means now is if you go to Okaichi, for instance, with the imagination exercise by GRA, which I already taken place, where you have officers, three or two of them, seated at the shop from morning to evening. That's when the trader closes the shop. So any person that buys from you with your invoices and all that, they, mm. they monitor your monetary activity. What that means is that they really want to ensure that whatever money that you know if they expect from traders has gotten, so nobody would you know, shortchange the Ghana Revenue Authority. And so they sit at the shop, monitor and monitor activities. But the traders see this to be forms of harassment and intimidation and very disrespectful. As well as they are not willing to pay the taxes. Taxes are used to develop the country. Yes, of course, they admit that. But this will only cripple their business. There are better things that they can do, which is, you know, scrapping some ladies and taxes on importation and even reviewing the tax policy, which, of course, would ensure that we're roping more people, widening the tax net and get more people on board so that we pay more money to develop the country. And so right. this is their concerns. And that's the reason they close down their shop. So if their concerns are not met, they can do more than that, which is, you know, they'll be left with no option that even protest, which is the GRA headquarters, finance ministry, and parliament. The, we know the vice president of Guta joined them to organize a news conference. Exactly, exactly. Uh, what exactly did he say? So he said, yes, yeah, so they have no option. If, if their concerns are not met, they think I've been too 
if their concerns are not met, this is what they're saying is they are going to go as far as protests at the GRA headquarters and, uh, yeah, finance ministry and parliament house. So it was a strong warning and they are not budging. And for them, uh, the business climate or the, uh, yeah, the business climate is not as conducive as it used to be. Uh, the money that they used to get made on a daily is not what they are getting. So if, if the GRA is planning to come with this exercise, uh, it's supposed to cripple their business so they can do better than this. We know that the meeting that we had with them had settled everything. And so therefore, we were not expecting them to conduct any invigilation exercise, even in any market, other than Abosokai here. We want to tell them that we will not accept any invigilation here. And that we want to tell them that the vast structure, as it pertains currently, is not uniformity and so therefore until they restructure the VAT system and make sure that the playing field is leveled we are not going to accept any invigilation in Abaswaka here and even across every market in Ghana here. Chabon! 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 As the Vice President of Guta Clement Boati earlier had us speak to my colleague George Queen in there. Now, two years after the devastating floods that washed away homes in Ketang, Law and the Ketu South areas, government is yet to commence the sea defence project to prevent severe flooding there. The opposition NDC has accused the government of being insensitive to the plight of the people. My colleague Komla Kruche reports. Ravage in the Atlantic Ocean came biting once more. Tidal waves hitting communities in the Anglo, Keta and the Ketu South areas have become an annual occurrence. The situation has so far caused most of the residents to salvage some of their belongings with many washed away. There are calls for the people to relocate to higher grounds. There is nowhere we can relocate to. Uh -huh. If we want to relocate, then we should be heading towards Adaklu area there. That is the only place that we can get a land to settle on. My colleagues had come. They thought it was political, so the minister had to come. Um, and before then, I had to file a question in Parliament. What the minister came to tell us was an assurance of uh, the continuation of the phase two of the defense project. And it's 2023. I haven't seen the minister. I haven't seen the work being done. I have not even heard from them. A distress call came in once more for help from the NDC flag bearer, John Mahama. Dr. Baumia was here to campaign for people to vote for him. He never bothered to step foot here to see the devastation the people are going through. I am sure some of the people who he's expecting to vote for him during their internal primaries are affected by this. Yes. Yes. How callous can you be that you are so desperate for people's vote that you care very little about their livelihood? The NDC leader dispatched a team of minority MPs to the aid of the affected residents with items to alleviate their plight from rice oil mattresses and other food items, the opposition party says government is insensitive. Our elders in Anglonland speak out. When President Kufado comes here and speak nicely to you, don't just listen to the, and clap. Speak out. Your land is going into the sea. And I can tell you there's a solution to this at the right time. I don't see them doing much about this. We are going to see the budget read sometime next month. The president should make sure that when he's Finance Minister comes to Parliament, they better come with some good news about the Kitasi defense. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. they're going to see a block, yeah, yeah. a block protest against the budget, no matter what it is. The entourage also called on Awome Fiatobi Sri, the second urging him to speak up on the floods. Earlier, John Mahama also donated some 200 bags of cement to the Dabala EP church to aid in the construction of a church auditorium upon a request from the church. Kamala Kluche there with those details. I was staying on this particular subject because this afternoon, the Member of Parliament for Ketu South, Ablaji Fagumashi, she's criticised the government for failing to attach seriousness to the plight of residents who've been affected by the tidal waves and floods in the constituency and adjoining ones. Thousands of people are facing a grim reality of floodwaters that have rendered them homeless weeks after torrential rain. Speaking on 3FM Sunrise this morning, Jifagumashi noted that
Several promises made by government remain unfulfilled as residents continue to bear the brunt of the rains and tidal waves. I have not seen my Minister for uh, Works and um, Housing since that visit in, in, in 2021. 21. I have not seen or heard from him. The last time I had anything close to an intervention was from the Minister for Finance who came to Parliament and based on uh, what uh, Honourable Harina do to then minority leader uh, charged him to do, that he should ensure that uh, the key defense issue appears or tidal wave issue appears in the in the budget. He came back to Parliament to say that he was setting aside 10, 10 million uh, Ghana CDs for disability studies. And I was horrified to hear that. Apart from what I have done personally on the floor, it's also the fact that the committee in charge in Parliament of, of Western Housing, the, 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 they were here and nothing beyond the rhetoric, the, beyond the regurgitation of, the, the regurgitation of promises upon promises, nothing more has been done. Well, she adds that government has succeeded in uh, rendering the National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO, dysfunctional and non-effective in responding to the concerns of her resident. Let me say that this government has destroyed NADMO. NADMO has become so toothless, it's not even funny. NADMO cannot provide 10 bags of rice, 10 bags of rice, to people who are, who are, who are in distress. NADMO cannot do any, any such thing. Or they have not done it. They should put me wrong. They should put me, if they were coming here with, with as much food as John Dramani Muhammad did, they would have come with the cameras. You would you'd be here. Your station would be here. You would have covered it. So it's not my word against this. It is the reality. It is what it is. NADMO is not effective. I mean, we, we saw what NADMO did back in the days. And, and when I see them, I'm the one who, uh, who told that I'm doing politics. This is not politics. Why is it that I'm screaming on top of my voice? I'm appealing, begging, and still, His Excellency, the President, has not responded. Abladjifa Goma, she's a member of Parliament for Kitusa. You're listening to the news here on 3FM 92.7. Or turn an attention to uh, the limited voter registration exercise. Today is the last day and interestingly, the Eastern Region branch of the NDC has called on the Inspector General of Police to beef up security at the District Office of the Electoral Commission in Upper West Achim. The opposition party is accusing the Governor New Patriotic Party's constituency chair, Nana, a day or Bobby of causing mayhem and intimidating EC officials by leading some thugs to fire gunshots. Yvonne Nikwe is my colleague. She's been monitoring exactly what it is that's been happening there. Yvonne, exactly what is the situation at the Upper West Achim constituency? Good afternoon, Eric. I just speak to you. The police has restored calm to the Upper West Achim registration center of the electoral committee. Now, yesterday, after midday, a conflict ensued between the political parties, i.e. the NPP and NDC, for reasons that they feel that people outside the constituency were being brought in to register their names. And so, gunshots were fired into the atmosphere. This morning, the police has ensured that none of those two political parties have their representatives there. They have rather reinforced we are personnel there to ensure that the exercise ends smoothly in their particular district. And for the political parties, is it a case they are bringing their own security as well, following what has been this warning? Well, for those who engaged in that uh, incident yesterday, they are not of the police, neither of the military. You could call them tax. I cannot really identify where they belong to, but there are persons who came in not wearing uniforms that you could clearly identify before engaging in that uh, uncivilized act. Mm, and so now security has been yeah. beefed up in the area? Yes, yeah, security is, is in the area. As I said early on, the two political parties have been sent away from the uh, registration center to ensure that the police guide the electoral commission to the process before it ends at 5 p.m. today.
Right, then, Yvonne. Uh, many thanks for those updates. That's Yvonne Nikui. And it's the last day of the limited voter registration exercise. Uh, it's been ongoing for the last two weeks. Uh, the last time the Electoral Commission provided updates, over 600,000 individuals had been registered onto the country's electoral roll uh, as they continued to make a case against the registration of minors, uh, an issue that they say is the basis or reason for which the Ghana card should be the sole identifier uh, for onward or subsequent registrations which will be organized by the Electoral Commission. Hence, they are going to take advantage of legislation and return to Parliament with an improved CI which makes the Ghana card the sole identifier. We're hoping to be able to uh, connect with uh, Jamal Kone, who's the Eastern Regional Secretary of the NDC. They raise the red flags in relation to that particular subject matter. But while we try to connect uh, with the NDC there, we can bring you some other matters where over 20,000 mentally challenged persons are to be removed from some streets of the country in a new project to be rolled out by the Mental Health Authority. The initiative expected to kick off by January 2024 is part of measures by the authority to tackle mental health management, management from a holistic approach. CEO of the authority, Dr. Ajwa Pinamanapa, has been speaking at the launch of the Global Mental Health Week here in Accra. Previously, we've had what is called the Commission Clear the Streets. It hasn't been too successful because um, funding became an issue and then it became a burden for the facilities. And so we went back to the drawing board and we believe that the issue is not just a little authority to solve, but we believe that um, we need to bring on board more stakeholders to help in solving these issues. So we will be coming up with a plan whereby the district assemblies and other stakeholders will be involved in this. We are looking at having these, um, this plan being in the community so that they can, um, the community goals and the becomes society goals so that it will be sustained. I call, uh, apologies for the poor quality of sound. Well, that's the CEO of the authority, Dr. Ajwa Pinama Apao. My colleague Grace Hamwajiman is joining uh, me with a bit more details. Grace, 20,000 mentally challenged persons to be removed from the streets. Is there a clear plan as to how this will happen? Because it's not the first time we're hearing of an initiative like this. Definitely, Marina. This is not the first time we're hearing of an initiative like this. What is new about this project is that Initially, or with the old project, government usually takes them off the street and then takes them to the health facilities. But this time, government is setting up smaller units in the district, in the communities, or even at home, so that for the cases that can be managed at home, they are managed at home. Those that can be managed at the district level should be managed at the district health facilities. And then those that need to go to the regional capital to also go to the regional capital so that there's no much pressure on the regional facilities just as was done in the first project. The mental health authority also tells us that they are also looking at other ways of treating these mental health illnesses apart from just taking them to the health facilities. Others just need um, people to listen to, people to talk to, like for social support and those other forms of treatment. So not all of them will also go to the health facilities as was done in the previous um, initiatives or projects. And so it's expected to kick off in January of next year? Exactly. It's expected to kick off in January of next year. They are still doing some sort of feasibility and piloting to see how best it can be rolled out. Of course, the question of um, funding and financing also comes in. And so they are also looking at that. But the mental health authority tells us that they are also looking at enrolling some of their treatment on diseases on the National Health Insurance Authority or on the scheme so that those that need to be treated at that level can also do that. Grace Amwajiman, many thanks. That's my colleague uh, providing a bit more detail. So 20,000 mentally challenged persons are to be removed from the streets in the country, not just here in the capital, in a new project to be ruled out by the Mental Health Authority. It will start in January of next year we'll wait to see what comes out of it but some more news as well 
uh, more tributes continue to come through. Uh, this one from Dr. Free Akuto, who's deciding to suspend his campaign tour as a result of the passing of Theresa Kufuan. Let me just walk you through it. As the flag bearer hopeful of the new patriotic party, Dr. Akuto Free, has suspended his final lap of the regional campaign tour following the death of former First Lady Theresa Kufo. Mrs. Kufo died on Sunday, as we've been telling you. And just a quote from him, which says that I'd plan to start my campaign tour today, October 2, to appeal to delegate to vote for me in the November 4 NPP presidential candidate elections. But the death of the former First Lady has struck us. And as a sign of respect, I have decided to suspend the campaign tour until further notice, Dr. Koto told the media. In Kumasi brings us to our top stories for you this afternoon where tributes have been pouring in thick and fast for the former First Lady led by the President. We just read to you one from flag bearer hopeful of the governing new patriotic party as well uh, et mensa was a former member of parliament for ningo pram pram unfortunately as well he passed as well yesterday he was a member of parliament for ningo pram pram for nearly 20 years a minister of sports and as well the mayor of a craft for some time as well and we mentioned that we would touch base in this constituency to get details as to exactly Exactly what the constituents there have had to say in relation to this. But I mentioned to you as well that today happens to be the final day of the limited voter registration uh, exercise, and there are high numbers at the registration center in the Ashanti region. Ibrahim Abubakar is my colleague there. He's been monitoring the situation. He's joined us on the telephone line uh, with a bit of details as to exactly what it is. Ibrahim, where are you? And I already witnessed that the numbers are quite high where you are. Uh, exactly, Mauna. I'm at the um, regional EC office where we have about four centers. Mauna, I can tell you that the number is swelling since the morning that we did. Um, I don't know. People are being registered. They are going. This happening. And even outside the premises, you can find a lot more people waiting for those sitting on chairs to move to the next level so that they also come and occupy it. And in fact, uh, what I'm seeing, I don't know if they will be able to register all these people by by them um, closing the period. Um, the process is a bit slow. In the morning, it started fast, but towards the midday, um, the machine is delaying a bit. But of course, the EC has made it clear to the applicant that if you are in the queue and it's 5 o'clock, they will ensure that they register you um, before you go home. But um, uh, what is happening and the numbers that keep coming here, um, maybe or less they spend the whole day here. And and for some of these first time voters, what has been the reaction to these long queues and what you're telling us is a delayed system a bit this afternoon? Well, most of them appear frustrated. In fact, um, I will, I'll try and engage with one or two of them. You can clearly see the frustration mm. shown on their faces because and some of them would think they may not be able to register. The affair is that uh, they will not be able to participate in the 2024 general election. But let me uh, engage with Briefly, one or two right. people on the matter, some of the applicants. Um, good afternoon, you are live on TV3. As an applicant, why did you have to wait for the last day before shooting? And I completed this year, so very soon. And when I came home, uh, you know, I had to uh, do one or two things before I, I could get a chance to come today. In an event you are unable to register, how do you feel and what do you expect authorities to do? So I'm not going to register. I will not be able to go to God really next year. And I guess that the authorities should extend the reward for the register. Uh, each and everybody could register. 
Right then, that's Ibrahim Abubakar speaking to one of the applicants uh, they're seeking to get onto the electoral roll before the deadline date today. That's our bulletin for you this afternoon. It came to you from our studios here on the John Hammond Street. I am Eric Mawenag, but as always, a lot more news if you log on to 3news.com. Mike Lugbudu is here ready and waiting to bring us the very latest from the world of business. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Business Daily. Coming up, Food and Beverages Association of Ghana blames high duties for decline in Ghana's imports. October prices are expected to rise. Also, Institute for Energy Securities, IES, projects prices to go up by about 3% in the first half of this month. October prices are expected to rise uh, across board for all petroleum products. Also, interest rates on government's treasury bill rises to 32.85%. I am Michael Lubudu. Bring you details of our headlines and many other stories coming up shortly. Please stay with us. Well, thank you for staying with us. Straight into our first story, as the Food and Beverages Association of Ghana, FABAG, says the influx of smuggled goods into the country is collapsing legitimate businesses. The Bank of Ghana summary of economic and financial reports indicates that Ghana's imports dropped by about 14.7% between August 2022 and August 2023. However, Executive Director of FABAG, John Awuni, believes the reduction is as a result of smuggling that are not captured by customs. Importers and traders have repeatedly lamented the high cost of doing business in Ghana due to high import duties and taxes, but their concerns have not received any attention from the government. According to the Food and Beverages Association of Ghana, businesses have resorted to smuggling their goods in order to remain profitable. The London cost of sugar, for instance, is at the time of port, it's like 550 cities, and you will still find sugar being sold in the Ghanaian market. At the retail end, about the same price, how possible can that be if people still have to price the goods the way they are supposed to be priced? You will find out that business, legitimate businesses so collapse. Some of them have set up satellite offices in Togo, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Burkina Faso and all that. And they get their Ghanaian uh, clients to travel through the borders, through uh, illegal routes. To go and then get these goods. The association has called on the government to take advantage of the 2024 budget statement to reduce taxes and import duties to curb the situation. In preparing for the 2024 budget in November, I would encourage the government to look at to look at to look at this. They must find a way of reducing the taxes. The tax regime is very very punitive. You can have over 50 percent tax on on a particular just a commodity and expect that people will survive. Rents have increased, electricity has increased, water bills have increased, general utilities, and then all the school fees and all that have gone up. So people must find ways of survival. And this is the reason why smuggling is rearing its head. That was the executive director of the Food and Beverages Association of Ghana, Fabak John Awuni, ending that report. Now, the Institute for Energy Security, IES, has projected diesel Tuba prices has to go up are... by some uh, 3% in the first pricing window of this month, which kicked in yesterday. Prices of other fuels are also expected to increase. This would mean price of LPG will see an upward adjustment for a third time running. Tuba, uh... Prices are expected to rise uh, across board for all petroleum products as international market activities continue to push prices of crude further. On the activities on the domestic forest, 
market, the Ghana city, did close the window at 11 cities, 50 four pesos to a dollar, depreciating by some 0.59%. And so putting all these factors together and posing it against previous prices, we believe the October 1st pricing window would see the price of gasoline go up by 1%, gas oil go up by 3%, NLPG go up by 1.5% per kilogram, which would be the third time LPG price has increased in the last three windows. That was Adam Yakubu, research analyst at the Institute for Energy Security, IES. Away from that, interest rates on government's treasury bills have gone up to 32.85%, although the auction recorded an undersubscription of about 2.7%. At the end of the latest treasury auction, government secured about 2.49 billion cities, although it targeted 2.57 billion cities. All bids tendered were accepted and a chunk of it came from the 91-day bill. Interest rates on the one-year bill shot up to 32.85% from 32.5% pre- the previous week. That of the 182-day bill also went up from 30.67% to 30.92% and yields on the 91-day bill soared by 0.29% to 28.5%. Now, away from that, the CEO of the Association of Ghana Industries, AGI, Seth Chum Akwabwa, has urged industries to consider energy efficient options to rake in more profits. According to him, energy efficient options are the smart way of reducing operational cost while saving the environment. He admonished businesses to take advantage of the AGI's energy efficiency network to become more competitive globally. If you appreciate where we're coming from, which is the establishment of the AGI Energy Service Center, which basically is promoting the use of renewable energy and promoting energy efficiency among our companies. What it basically means is that be more efficient in the usage of your energy to reduce energy costs. If you reduce energy costs, you reduce cost of production, and if you reduce cost of production, you become more competitive and capture a good share of the market. And the competitiveness is not just the local market, it's also the export market, both within Africa and beyond. So if you look at all this, then we have a very good objective to help promote Made in Ghana products, both locally and abroad, using competitiveness as a yastic. Seth Chum Akwabua is the president of the Association of Ghana Industries, AGI. And that will be all for Business Daily here on 3FM. For more business stories, please check out our website, 3news.com. My name is Michael Lubudu. Thank you for listening. As always, please stay safe. Up next... It's Black Rasta.